actually, we are not even going to start with this. We're going to do something very simple. Can you all do me a favor? Just stand up for a bit. I'm going to stretch up a little bit. Because I've been sitting and, oh, man, I needed that. Oh, yeah, no, I'm happy, happy people. Yeah, just from the portals. We can talk more about that later. All right, I think we're good. I just thought it'd be a good little thing because I needed that too. Um, so I'm going to talk about JavaScript D3, mainly for those of you who, well, obviously, Exchange AFs meet up, so no JavaScript, right? How many people here have actually played around at least a little bit with D3? Oh, a few people. How many consider themselves good with D3? And how many people here know jQuery? Uh, awesome. That's, that, that's, that's what makes me happy to see. Um, I'll very quickly show you two things. One thing is this property assessment map. Um, I showed it last year, I think, at one of the demos before we, it came out. But um, just really quickly here, Mapbox GL drives the visualization on the back here. Um, but it's actually D3 that showed, that allows for the interaction. So if I, this, this is a visualization that shows property assessments, $507,000 uh, is the assessment that I consider to be median here. And then anything that's above yellow to red is more ex higher assessment. Anything that's lower is blue. Um, what you see here as a result of the visualization is these are man-made ponds in the north side of Edmonton. So if you have property assessments, um, yeah, properties that are closer, that are backing into the ponds, have a higher assessment, which kind of makes sense. They're more expensive generally. So, uh, but all these interactions, I click on this, say I ooh, forget the, the, the zoom for a uh, Mac is different. That's still pretty fast. Those zooms are on a better slow network. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah, it, this is built to be a little bit fast. It did preload. But in any case, if I click on this, now everything rotates to say, if I lived on this property, my neighbors, what are their assessments relative to mine, right? And all of that is driven by D3. The, this, this story thing is also. Um, the other part here is a visualization on NGL, payroll, or any of these metrics um, relative to performance in terms of the... Uh, Stanley Cup. So for instance, all of these things here, these dark blue ones, are NHL champions. So kind of if you look at payroll, in general, like, like the, these two years here, 2016, 2017, the two, these two teams won the Stanley Cup. And Pittsburgh was ranked second in terms of payroll. Uh, Pittsburgh was, and then Pittsburgh won again. Um, in this case, ranked fourth in terms of payroll in that year. And then you could do other things. Like you could look at shooting, and then the one, the favorite example I have is uh, is penalty minutes. You'd think that NHL teams that have a lot of penalty minutes don't do so well, but in this one case, Anaheim had was a top in terms of penalty minutes, but still won the Stanley Cup. You could do other things like you know uh, look at the Oilers and and see where they rank. You don't have to just tag it to just a specific uh, just to the Stanley Cup. Anyways, this is relevant because I'm going to be showing you guys bar charts, which doesn't sound like the sexiest thing. But I'm going to convince you that after that, you'll understand how this works. And it's not as complex as you think. D3, introduction. Um, I'll let you guys read that. But basically, binding data to the DOM. And because everyone here, pretty much everyone here has done jQuery, you already know how to use D3, more or less, right? It's really, really simple. In fact, I'm going to zoom in a little bit more here, if that's possible. And I just don't know how to use Chrome. How do I zoom in a little bit? Oh, right. This, this, I remember this. Uh, this is, I can't even remember the JavaScript framework here, but it's the one that lets you do this stuff. And it always scales itself, even if you try and force it. So anyways, I'll leave it. But you can see, over here you have the, uh, you just select the DOM object. Same thing right here. I have an attribute that I want to put in called Earth. I don't know why. That's an at oh, yeah. the alt. So basically, the alt text for an image, right? Um, you can do CSS. Just add CSS. In this case, you call it style. Add class versus classed is true or false. False means you want to take that off. And an on-click. 
So that's pretty good, right? That's, that's D3 right there. Most of it is just right there. The rest of this is fluff that I'm going to be showing you guys. So uh, let's start off with a sandbox. And in this case, I just have really simple HTML. I have an input button that, when you click it, runs code for on click, uh, wait, run code. And I have just this <coughs> div with two paragraphs. What I do is I select the elements like you would with jQuery. I say the box, select all paragraphs that have the class standard. And all this is available online. If you guys have questions or want to reference it, you can. But just to make sure you realize there's no trick here, you can take a look at it. That's exactly the code as is, right? So you can play around with it. I will warn you, though, I kind of had to put in some D3 v4 code or you know examples in here to keep it more relevant so there's a little bit of mix of a mix of old and new code but the syntax is pretty much the same so um, i add a style of um, changing the font size and i hit run d3 code which runs this function here and voila awesome simple really really simple and Guess as to what is going to happen here. Anyone? Yeah. <laughs> Woo. Exactly. So there you go. Um, now, what if I want to add elements? Uh, you know, like it's fine. I'm just recreating HTML code with JavaScript. Uh, what if I want to add my data? So I first add the data here. I start removing a couple of things. So these things are selecting all the, the, uh, the paragraph standard. I want to select. Um, well, I select for elements that will but currently don't exist. So in this case, a paragraph with a new P class. And then I bind that data to this thing that still currently does not exist. And then I say I want to focus on only those elements that are new, and I'm entering into those. And after that, I say append P, class new P, and then just add text in. Oh, this code was written before some new ES6. Uh, there's no ES6 in this, except for maybe one place. So you'll see vars and not let. So please forgive me for that. Um, well, there you go. So if I hit this code, I get new paragraphs. So that data drove creating this new stuff. And then I just need to add an on click. And when I click on it, there you go. Really straightforward. I have like a couple. This is, this is really quick, so my intervention. Intermission, <laughs> overview, you've selected, modified, added. You've added an event to an on click. Really straightforward, right? Now let's cover some of these new things, uh, other things, SVG graphics, bar charts, and then some of the more interesting things that you'll see with D3. I'm going to try and convince you it's really, really simple to do. So SVG, Scalable Vector Graphics. If you guys seen SVG code, this is what it looks like. This, like I said, no, no, nothing crazy here. Literally, this is exactly the code that you see on the left side. It's just HTML elements or elements, and you just have syntax for SVG, right? So really straightforward. Um, Things to note, I don't know, fill red, pretty straightforward stuff. Um, and if you, like, there's a lot of documentation out there for what SVG objects are. The most interesting ones are the path ones, but in general, a lot of really interesting visualizations can easily be done with just rectangles and circles. So this is what, if you use SVG code to create a bar chart or a row in a bar chart, this is what it looks like. The SVG is over here. You have a text element, a rectangle, and a text, which goes the bananas here, the rectangles here, and the value of 200 is here. If you want to recreate this with D3, it's pretty straightforward. You just have what you had on the left side and what I just showed you earlier on. You just recreate it with D3. Uh, and this is the full recreation of that, of this code in SVG. This is just the syntax, right? You create the elements, you add the attributes, that's all. Now, we're going to try and do the same select and then bind and enter 
pattern. In this case, I'm adding data, call it my data. Banana, apple, a value of 200, 120. Um, and I just added to the text that I, uh, this, the code that I had previously to bind, to, wait, to select, to bind, and then enter in those, into those elements. And then I run the code, and something's wrong. I'm only seeing banana, and I'm trying to figure out what, what's wrong here. Is my code working correctly? And I look, oh wait, there's two of these bananas, so that doesn't make sense. Well, you know something's wrong there. And the really straight answer is, just that I forgot to set the attributes of Y, so you need the Ys to move down. So if, um, I, when you look at attributes, there's, you can call for function or any of these uh, things that you want to set. Um, you have a function, the data that's going to come back is one of the two um, array elements from my data, which is what D is, and then I just tells you the index of that within the array. So it's either 0 or 1 in this case. So if it's 0, 0 times 40, so you get just 0 plus 24, and then the next one is an additional 40 pixels down. And uh, also the other thing that I wanted to do was, yeah, the width, I didn't want to have a fixed width, so here I have the data, uh, which itself is an object, right? If I go back over here, it's an object, or yeah, and then I'm just saying the property is V that I want to use, and please return the value which gives me the width. And I do that, and I have this. So now I have a, a bar chart uh, with two rows, but the code's not very dry or organized. If you noticed here, like look at that, that's like having to do select all and then for all these separate elements. And then at this point here, you have to do Ys for every one of these elements, which again is pain. So what you end up doing is you create this group or G element, and then you do the transformations in terms of Y positions only on that G, so you don't have to do it for all the other elements. If you look at the amount of code, you've done, added this code here, but everything in red for just the title is removed. And you could do a similar thing for both the rectangle and the value label. So it makes it a lot more easy to keep in mind and the code looks cleaner too. And if you do that, I'll take a look here, inspect, there you go. You have a G that's got a transform of 0, 0, and then 0, 40, which now has those elements in there, but each of these I didn't have to set. You kind of need to set the Y for just where the text is, because I think at zero the text is like quite high up. Anyways, point is you didn't have to do it separately for these. Now, really quick thing, transitions. We covered all these things, indexing as well. Now transitions and the pattern. So I wanted to add additional rows. I just add data. I didn't have to do any extra code. And now I have a full bar chart. I have these three lines, these magical three lines. I say I want to do a transition. I want to say that it's going to take two seconds. And I didn't like the blue, so you know what? Change it to red. Right? That's all I did. I didn't have to like interpolate between red and blue, or blue and red, or anything like that. I just said, this is the final state. You take care of the rest. And that's what D3 does. Uh, index and overlay, oh yeah. So because, again, I talked about index before, now I can say set a delay element uh, index times 100, and then you get this, right? Yeah, just like one line, well, essentially one line of code. So there you go. And then finally, uh, I say, let's say I start off at a different location. Because I think the SVG is like 500 by 500 or 400 by 400, I'm saying start off when I first have this data, um, have the row actually be below the screen. So you can't see it all. And then over here, I say transition of 2000 and you know just put it into the correct location as before. Um, yeah, that's exactly it. But now I just have a delay. Anyways, I'll just show you. Run, there you go, right? Another ooh. I love this. I mean, like, again, you didn't have to do very much in terms of code. And this stuff here that you see, these are just divs, right? They're just divs. They're actually not even SVG at this point. They're just divs that have an X position or a Y position that's just moved up and down. 
So it's kind of neat, right? Like these bar charts seem fairly straightforward, but that's what you can do. So, so far we've been doing drawing with just one set of data. How many minutes am I at? Okay, uh, I'll try to rush this, sorry. Um, all right, general update pattern. Um, so far we've done this whole thing where you select and then you bind data and you enter into it and do things with it. But now if I have new data, I'm gonna change the syntax a bit. I'm gonna say instead of just row, I'm gonna call it row updated. And it basically refers to just thinking about elements that are gonna come in, um, but they're already in the DOM. And then this one entered, which is shown here. This is part of the pattern that I showed earlier. This is everything that we've learned so far. It's really this thing right here. But I'm splitting it up. And I'm adding one called row updated. Well, I'm doing this strange syntax of merging the updated stuff, as well as the row entered here. You might not understand this right now, but this is where I think it's more important. I can show you what that all does and why we split it up. So in this case, we have um, extra data that I'm adding in. So I'm calling that draw function twice, right? So when I first do this first draw, my data, I have two elements here, or I have uh, two, uh, two data objects here within this array, and I just want to focus on these parts here, right? Which is the code is appending a group, a G, and putting a class on those Gs because this is new data. And then where after these things get merged, you can also, uh, it'll also get class both as well. And then if I go to this extra data, what you'll notice is that in this case, banana's the same, but the value has changed. So what happens is this code here gets executed, right? So now its class is updated. And at the bottom, again, both gets added as a class. And then this final piece of data here that I've added on the second call to draw, um, it goes through the same thing as the first part where it's a new element, they've never seen Apple before, so class it entered and then class it both. All right, now that we've gone through that pattern, I am adding new data here uh, and as you can see, everything here has just had a value change with exception of durian. Right? How many here have eaten a durian before? It's amazing, isn't it? Don't tell me otherwise. Um, okay, so let's run code here. This is what we've seen before. Now I'm gonna hit redraw, which adds a new data, or just an additional call, uh, call to draw with the new data. And you can see. So what happened was the durian piece is new, so it's now coming from the bottom up to the top, and these values just adjust accordingly, right? Okay, I can wait, but I was just gonna show you how it goes from 200 here, right, for banana, I hit redraw, it's 100. Uh, resorting, this is, all I'm doing here is sorting the array itself to, um, to the max value on top. So I run the code first, I hit redraw, and get to this point. So now it's sorted. Um, I've talked about entering and updating. I haven't talked about exiting, so in this case, I deleted from the new data, banana and apple, now they don't exist, so if I hit redraw, this stuff gets executed. Basically after this exit, I'm saying, please transition with a duration of two seconds, move it to the right of the screen where nobody can see it, redraw, there you go. And then, this is like the last few slides, so this is pretty quick, but this is my favorite part where I run the code, and Basically, like the comment says, I'm randomly removing things, adding things, changing values, but I do that. And then what you see is these things like trying to move back and forth. Now, the reason why that's happening, and I call it a little bit of a dance, is uh, when you do an exit, or at least the way I've cons considered exit here, it actually gets removed at the end. But when it's still transitioning to the right-hand side and not fully gotten to the position it needs to, it's dancing in the air, it's still like, and then so if you hit redraw again, and the element appears back into the array, then it's going to go back to the correct position. So that's what's happening over here. I just have to do this again. It's fun to watch it, sorry. 
All right, so um, main point, this is Lego. Like, the, what it comes down to, everything you've seen here is the magic that comes from data visualization, right? Those beautiful things, it's just, uh, often it's just using D3 code, and it's just really simple stuff that you see here. But like Lego, you can do so much with it if you understand how it works, how to put things together, and that's something that if you know the skills to do, then you can think about like what is the end goal or the visualization, visualization you want to see. And then it just becomes a matter of changing attributes. Um, and oh, this one's an important point too. So I initially did this, um, I did this workshop that led people through creating those bar charts, and I don't have the time to show you this, but eventually what happens is I take the bar chart, which is everything that you've seen so far, and with a few lines of code, and in this case, maybe a little bit more than a few lines of code, I transfer those bar charts into this visualization. Because if you think about it, the X and Y positions can easily be said, okay, give me the day of the week if it's a date, and let that set my, day, my, my X and Y position. And the values, instead of having it be the width of a rectangle, let that change into the color that I'm going to see. So that's that. And we covered all of this stuff. You guys are experts now. Alternative libraries, uh, there's processing, Pixie.js. Uh, Nathan mentioned uh, 3.js, which is true too. You could look at 3.js in terms of data visualization. Um, and I'm not gonna go through these, but I think that's good. I'm also just gonna mention two quick things too. Uh, yeah. This thing that you see here, I, I do need to kind of pitch this, so really quick. Um, this map, uh, there's a conference called OpenVisConf. It's a pretty big conference for data visualization. Uh, it's being, it's usually held in Boston, but it's now held in Paris. And I'm thankful I got selected to do a workshop on showing people how to create deep detailed maps like this. And that's happening in May. So if you guys are interested, check out OpenVisCom, go to that thing. The other thing that I wanted to quickly pitch, it's a, it's a cry for help. Uh, I need some help with, uh, with trying to get libraries from ES6 into just normal, uh, normal JavaScript. And I know there's Webpack and stuff like that, but I'm writing a library for, at, for stuff that I'm doing at school. And it's basically like a JavaScript library. I'm really using just ES6 and just ignoring everything, and that's gonna bite me, so I just need some help with that. Sorry, I know it's not part of the presentation, but <laughs> I figured I'd ask because I'm here. You gave a good presentation, you might as well get something out of it, it's fine. Sure, uh, that's it. I, if you guys have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, sure. It's the quick one though, because the other one is. Sure, go ahead. Uh, so what are the like performance limitations of D3 and have you ever run into them? Every time I've done this, people ask me about the performance <laughs> limitations. Uh, short answer is right now I'm showing you how to do this with SVG. You can easily do, um, do things with Canvas as well. So Canvas helps in terms of performance. But even then, you get limited as to how many polygons, how many circles, how many squares you can have. So there are limitations, WebGL is you know, if you want to draw as many things as possible, it's obviously the thing to go to. Unfortunately, um, if you guys have taken a look at WebGL, like I'm not quoting WebGL, so it was like not, not for me. Um, but yeah, there are some performance limitations. But then there are other libraries out there like Pixie.js, which abstract, it's supposed to be for gaming, that library, but you could use it to build data visualizations. I've tried and I've actually used it to some success, right? So you can use that because that leverages WebGL if that's available on your browser and it falls back to Canvas if it doesn't. So. Um, the, <clears throat> it has nothing to do with what you presented. I just wanted to know what your favorite data set would, what would you like to work on? What's the data set that you would like to like visualize? visualize? Uh, there's so much data out yeah, there. Is there something in particular you would like to look at? Like I'm looking at Kaggle yeah. all the time and look at new data sets. And then there's a couple of ones from Zillow that are really good. Um, but is there anything that you would in particular like to work on? Yes, this, I have to show you guys this. Uh, 
I'm interested in doing something a little bit different these days sometimes. So this is a project that I'm doing for school. Um, anyways, I want to visualize algorithms and trying to expose how algorithms work, how they could be made better. So for instance, these are Markov chains. I'm not going to explain them. This is going to make no sense to most people here, and that's fine. But look, I get to create these things, and I get to regenerate them. Uh, and then I get to evaluate them, right? So now I get to see what the, the red spots are values of the uh, states. This is for AI, basically, for reinforcement learning. So actually, the answer is not data, actually. Uh, it's algorithms. I'm kind of interested to see how I can like, make them visualize. And if you can understand how visual algorithms work, then you can make them more performant. And you can like, see, why is this, doing, this agent running against the wall and not doing anything, right? So being able to visualize that, I think, is interesting. So it's not necessarily data, but that's kind of the next thing I was looking at. <laughs> well, the U of A works on that, right? They work on the classifier identification, different classifiers, and try to figure out which classifier works best in which case. Yeah, that's uh, what you do, but you visualize it in a better way. Yeah, there's there's so much in data science, right? There's just you could pick anything, honestly. There's like so many profs at the U of A who are leading experts at different things. So, like, do you want to do like data mining, uh, clustering? Do you want to do AI, do you want to do just a whole bunch of things? So um, this is something that I just picked off uh, just in my first year, and I'll probably keep looking at things like that. Yeah. I had a question. So you pointed out the similarity between kind of the syntax there of jQuery and D3. Um, where does that come from? Like there's that, because this is something uh, that grammar of graphics thing too. Uh, in R, it's a layered grammar of graphics. And it's a similar thing where you kind of layer uh, these functional calls one after another, and it comes out as a kind of declarative language where you actually have access to like these programmatic aspects. That's really quite powerful. I, I had never kind of tied that into jQuery before. Is that something that we saw before jQuery? Where did, I'm wondering where that came from. Does anybody, can anybody else? That's a good question. I honestly don't know. Okay. Good. Yeah, it's I, just, it's, it's I wonder, because like, I, I think, uh, Sean, like you mentioned, Raphael, but I remember seeing that syntax. Uh, Raphael is like after jQuery. Ah, okay, fair enough. Yeah. I'm not sure. If you want to look at like, interesting data structures, too, uh, or visualization structures, processing is very object-oriented in the way it looks at uh, how visualizations occur. And I remember looking at it, and I think it's useful for certain projects, but if you're interested in that, I would encourage you to maybe even look at processing. It doesn't answer your question, no. but it's a different way of like looking at how data visualizations could be structured. OK, no, thank you. All right, DJ, I'm going to end your talk officially and get an applause roll. And our okay. Exchange JS is Edmonton's JavaScript meetup. Thanks to our sponsors, Jobber and Investopedia. Support the meetup and like and share this video. And stay informed by following us on Twitter and meetup.com. Links in the description. See you soon!